I have three case studies um, th that I've worked on recently. Um, they're in the realm of phase two adaptive dose finding. Um, so the goal is more about picking a correct dose um, and assigning, um, uh, increasing the number of subjects assigned to the correct dose um, so that the client can uh, more effectively examine that correct dose um, for, for the primary endpoint and, and then for additional endpoints. So the first one is in uh, post-surgical pain. Um, it's a combination proof of concept and dose exploration um, uh, in, in, in the first stage. And, and then we did a, a maximizing design in the second stage to find a dose with maximum clinical utility. Um, the outline of this section uh, for this case study is to talk about the adaptive design um, and define the customized clinical utility function um, that was used to drive the uh, randomization algorithm and then show you simulation results that document the performance characteristics uh, of, of the algorithm and, and then end with a few remarks about this case study. So this is an overall summary to let you know where I'm going to end up and, and how I got there. Um, this is a phase two trial versus placebo and versus active control um, in post-surgical uh, analgesia. Uh, objective is to um, demonstrate proof of concept and estimate the dose um, with optimal balance between maximizing efficacy while minimizing intolerance. We used a maximizing design um, that was published in 2009 for an application at Merck uh, by uh, Anastasia Ivanova. Um, and that was chosen to yield better quality information, in particular to assign fewer patients to dose regimens which are either ineffective or intolerable. Uh, the true potential, we, we accomplished that by um, Simu by defining a spectrum of true potential efficacy and tolerability dose response curves. Um, and, and then um, we constructed a clinical utility function uh, from those efficacy and tolerability curves. Um, and then we simulated uh, the performance characteristics of the design across that spectrum of curves. And what we found um, by using this design was that it had high probability to estimate the correct or near to the correct dose um, that, that had the maximum clinical utility. And, and it maximized assignment of subjects to the target dose while minimizing assignment of subjects to doses remote from the target. So the way the design works um, is that it uh, proceeds in cohorts of subjects, and each cohort is randomized to one or two doses plus the controls. Um, so if you start with doses three and four, um, and you get an observation of an increase, I'm sorry, of a, a, a negative slope, then that means the maximum is to the left. So then the next cohort, the next cohort gets randomized to the two lower doses. And if the slope is positive, then you increase the dose uh, by one increment for the next two cohorts. So, so that's how it works. Um, it, it uses, instead of just positive and negative slopes, it uses a t-statistic, um, and you can uh, put the t-statistic um, if the t-statistic comes out in a narrow range, like plus three or minus, uh, like plus 0.3, between minus 0.3 and plus 0.3, then you could stay at the same two doses. Um, you can play with that value and narrow it, but if you shrink it to zero, then it's like an up and down, just oscillating between uh, pairs of doses. Um, that are centered around the maximum. But then that will uh, pretty much ensure that you have the maximum number of subjects at the maximum dose because uh, part of the time it'll be the higher of the two doses and the other part of the time it'll be the lower of the two doses. 
So the client was interested in having stage A kind of stand alone for proof of concept. Um, so we uh, randomized 150 subjects um, in equal proportions to placebo, four doses of the test drug, and active control. Um, and then there was a, a pause uh, for an interim analysis um, to, to demonstrate proof of concept and pick the two doses with which to start um, the second stage, which was run via the maximizing design um, based on clinical utility. Um, the patients in that second stage were randomized in 10 successive weekly cohorts. There were expected to be approximately 25 subjects uh, in each weekly cohort. Um, and we randomized them uh, in the ratios shown um, in order to um, increase the number of subjects assigned to active treatment and yet provide uh, enough subjects on the two controls um, so that um, we could do a meaningful analysis at the end. The, rather than um, define a clinical utility function that was a linear combination of the efficacy and safety endpoint in closed form, um, a, the clinician wanted to um, define uh, utility um, to, to, to combine regions of, of, of clinical efficacy. So what we did was we put tolerability across the columns and efficacy across the rows, and we defined ranges where uh, in the leftmost column uh, the active treatment um, had, had uh, worse tolerability than the test treatment, uh, which was similar to placebo. Um, so in the best efficacy case where the test treatment is better than the active control, which is better than placebo, that's the best possible utility score of 100. And, and then we defined regions where the control had worse tolerability than the test treatment, but the test treatment was worse tolerability than placebo. And then there's a region where the test treatment is similar to the uh, active control, and then the worst region is where the test treatment is worse than the active control. And similar, we define similar ranges for, for um, efficacy. Um, th this slide shows the values of the efficacy, um, which was measured, uh, it was, it's post-surgical pain, so it's a zero to 10 point numeric rating scale. So if the uh, test treatment was worse than um, the active control by more than a unit, then that was the, the, the worst case for efficacy. If it was within a half a unit, um, th then that, that's kind of similar efficacy. And if it was better by from a half to 1.5 units, that's, that's one level of better efficacy. And if it was better by more than a, a, a unit and a half, uh, that was the best possible. A and then we defined similar ranges for tolerability uh, based on proportions, uh, I'm sorry, percents of adverse experiences. Um, and, and you could see those, those values there. And then the clinician, uh, the clinician defined um, values in the matrix. Um, so when we ran the trial, we got the uh, results of each cohort for each dose and, and used uh, interpolation uh, to find the, the actual clinical utility value uh, after each cohort and then make the adaptation. The efficacy dose response curves that we considered um, are listed on this slide. Um, they're the four doses of drug and the active control and placebo. And um, we were interested in comparing to the active control, so we arbitrarily gave it a value of zero and then uh, had um, 
a series of three high dose responses um, where where the drug where the drug was was better than the active control and, and our four high high dose response scenarios and then we had three um, medium dose uh, response scenarios where uh, there was at the high dose uh, similarity to the active control <laughs> and then we looked at the null case um, where the drug was not effective at all. And those dose-response curves are, are plotted on this slide. For tolerability, um, th these are in, in differences of uh, pr proportions of, of AEs. Um, again, differences from the active control. Uh, and again, we had um, high levels of difference, medium levels of difference, and low levels of difference where um, a negative indicates fewer, a, a smaller proportion of, of AEs um, than, than control. Um, so, so you could see there's a spectrum of possibilities here. Um, and those, those tolerability curves are, 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 pl are plotted on, on this slide. Then you could put all possible combinations of those curves together. Um, th there were 54, 56 possible combinations of, of those curves to define the clinical utility functions. Rather than run all 56, we picked the highlighted clinical utility curves because many of them were generally similar. So we picked um, I think it was 14 uh, clinical, uh, 14, the 14 highlighted curves um, to, to simulate the, the adaptive design because they're generally representative of, a, of the spectrum of possibilities. Um, These are, these are those 14 curves, and I've highlighted the, the, the um, value of the, it, to indicate the dose that had the maximum clinical utility. Um, th these are those 14 curves that we simulated. So they vary from doses with high clinical utility to doses with low clinical utility. And, and, and this is, a plot of, of all of those curves, so you can kind of see that um, it, it covers a wide range of potential true underlying clinical utilities. So then we simulated, um, according to these specs, um, there were 25 on each dose in stage A, and then there were 10 cohorts of 25 uh, randomized in the ratios that I talked about before, and the two doses were picked according to the algorithm for each uh, set of cohorts. We did a thousand simulations of each curve. We assumed normally distributed um, clinical utility function values, um, and we picked a conservative standard deviation based on a uniform from zero to a hundred. Um, we didn't make any truncation of values either. Um, so we did that in order to, to be conservative. So when the normal distribution was simulated, it could simulate uh, um, a, a, a clinical utility value less than um, zero or greater than 100, even though the means were within that range. So to summarize the 1,000 simulations of each trial, we looked at the average estimated target dose, the proportion of simulations in which the correct target dose was estimated, and the proportion of simulations in which we estimated adjacent to the correct target dose. And, and we also looked at the number of subjects assigned to each dose um, to, to evaluate whether the design was working the way it should. <laughs> Um, this slide is a, um, uh, a textual summary of the results of those simulations. Um, over 50% of the simulations yielded 
the correct estimate of the target dose. And those percents range from 58 to 98, depending on the curves. Um, when the curves were more peaked, it was a lot better. And when they were not as peaked, um, it, it was lower. Uh, the median, however, was close to 90%. And over 91, at least 91% of the simulations yielded the estimated target dose at or adjacent to the true target. So it was almost never uh, far away. Um, so the design was functioning as it should. Most of the subjects were allocated at or adjacent to the target dose. Um, an equal allocation design would have assigned 65 subjects per dose. Um, for all 14 scenarios we examined, the maximizing design assigned at least 68 to the target dose, and the range was 68 to 105. Um, the range of sample size at the dose that was farthest from the target was small, um, only 25 to 62. So the design was working the way we thought it should, and the client chose to use it. Um, Chuck stepped out. What time do I have till? 10.30? Ten fifteen, okay. Um, those of you that got a thumb drive, all these slides are in there. You could look at the the individual numeric results. Hmm? Oh, I have to have ten thirty. Okay. All right. So um, on this slide uh, is the average estimated target dose next to the true target dose. So you can scan down those columns and see that. Um, it was estimating close to the target. Um, the percent of simulations that, identif that correctly identified the target dose is in that third column, actually the fourth column, but the third results column. Um, and they're generally high, but when they're not high, then the percent uh, uh, estimating adjacent to the target dose was high, so that the percent of simulations estimating at or adjacent to the target dose was very high. Now, there were only four doses, so it's not that hard to come up with this, but the key is that it's avoiding the place that you don't want to be. And then these are the average sample sizes assigned to each of the doses for the scenarios. Uh, I highlighted in yellow the, the, uh, tr where, where the true uh, underlying uh, maximum utility dose is, and you can see that those percentages are, are I'm sorry, those numbers are um, high. This is that 68 to uh, 105 range that I pointed out on the slide, uh, on the verbal slide. So again, the overall summary is a repeat of what I talked about at the beginning. In uh, summary, the last bullet, um, we had high probability of estimating the correct or nearly the correct dose. Uh, it maximized assignment at the target dose and minimized the assignment of subjects away from the target dose. Um, the study actually completed um, uh, last month, and they're in the process of analyzing the data, and when that company makes its announcement of the trial, then the results will be um, available. The second case study, um, yeah, do you have a, sure, sure, yeah, it's fine. Unbiased to the 
Yeah, um, that, that's a good question. Um, w w when we did adaptive designs focused on efficacy, we looked at that. Um, and if you use a modeling approach, like a four-parameter logistic S-shape model, the, the, those estimates are, are generally um, n not biased. But uh, other adaptive approaches use um, isotonic regression. And, and so, you know, isotonic regression estimates would be, are biased um, at the extremes, more, more biased at the extremes. So they could be biased. You still have um, the raw mean estimates at, at each dose. Um, so if you, the, the bottom line is if you use a modeling approach, um, you get generally unbiased estimates. Um, but if you use an isotonic regression approach, those could be biased. So you might use isotonic regression um, to, to, to demonstrate proof of concept, but, but then to, to derive estimates from phase three, you might use a more classical um, uh, modeling approach. Um, the algorithmic assignment of subjects that focuses at target levels of response generally doesn't induce um, bias. The bias comes from the method that you use to combine the data. Uh, it wasn't a model. There was no model uh, involved. Um, the, cl the clinician filled out that clinical utility table um, based on his perception of the clinical value of those magnitudes of differences based on his experience in the therapeutic area. And then we used interpolation, linear interpolation in two dimensions to get the estimates. Um, the second case study is an adaptive dose finding design for a two drug combination. Um, the, the assumptions for this design uh, are, are on this slide. The, the, the primary endpoint was a, a, a zero to three Likert scale global assessment of response to therapy um, to measure efficacy. It was either none, some, good, or excellent. Since the sample size is large, um, we propose to use continuous endpoint statistical methods. Um, that's been done in pain studies. This was not a pain study, um, but, but it had a similar type of response. So that, that, that's what we tried, that, that's what we used. Um, the prior data suggested that um, the mean difference from where the mean values for active and placebo were the mean differences that were targeted are, are 1.6 and 2.2, and, and the standard deviation was 0.9. So if you take those values and consider a sample size to discriminate between two groups of subjects, you get 41 per group. Um, so a traditional design would have probably only two or three dose combinations, maybe four, um, and it might have a sample size of around 123 to 164 subjects. So we use that sample size to come with an adaptive design that was going to include all, uh, include nine combinations, three of each treatment. Um, and, and placebo. Um, we used, again, uh, developed by Anastasia Ivanova, um, her 2012 paper identifies a Bayesian isotonic um, uh, design in one dimension, which we generalized uh, into two, well, no, she talks about two dimensions, and, and we used her two-dimensional approach um, with a software tool we have uh, for in-house. The way this design worked is uh, we had an initial cohort where um, 
there were uh, four subjects on, uh, assigned to each of the nine dose combinations and then 10 to placebo. Um, because of logistical constraints, um, the client was considering adding three additional cohorts of, of 30 each. Um, and, and the doses for those additional three cohorts we're going to sign adaptively per the um, uh, Ivanova design extension that we used. And w what it does is um, we sought to optimize uh, dose assignments to target levels of response uh, a half a unit and one unit better than placebo. The design assumes a non-decreasing response in two dimensions, um, and it models the dose-response relationship via isotonic regression and then computes a Bayesian posterior from that. I'm not going through the technical details. They're in her talk. Um, this is an applied presentation to show you what it did. Th that, that isotonic assumption um, re re refines the, the precision to, um, to, to, to estimate a non-decreasing dose response curve, which was felt to underlie the situation. Um, do I need to explain what isotonic regression is? It creates least squares estimates that are non-decreasing um, without regard to shape except for the non-decreasing assumption. Sorry? I don't know the answer to that. switches the data such, that, such as to minimize the amount of change, but adhere to the non-decreasing non assumption. So essentially that's, I mean... In the simple, really yeah, in the simple case where you have equal sample size at each dose, it would replace the responses which are violating the non-decreasing assumption in doses two and three. It will replace them with the average of two and three. And similarly at five and six. But where there's no violation, then it, it uses that value. Um, Anastasia's design um, in the three by three case uh, computes the Bayesian isotonic regression means from all the data in the previous cohorts. Um, and then it assigns patients to uh, dose combinations in the subsequent cohorts um, using the Bayesian posterior distribution proportions of simulations that each dose was chosen as the dose with the target level of response. So for example, um, and since we had two levels of target response, we just took half of each cohort and optimized it for the lower target and the other half for the upper target. Um, for example, if, if um, doses one, two, and three are closest to the target in 25, 50, and 25 percent of the posterior distribution samples, then the randomization ratios are one to two to one to those doses. And then uh, it, it, after the four cohorts are simulated and uh, uh, doses assigned adaptively for cohorts two, three, and four, um, then we fit an isotonic regression means and test for difference from placebo and, and estimate the target doses. Um, for this design, the performance characteristics are power to yield a difference from placebo. Um, the average sample size assigned per dose in relation to where the target level of response is, and again, the probability of identifying the correct target dose. Um, these are the true underlying scenarios that, that we used. If 
D1, D2, D3 or the increasing doses of the one component and R1, R2, R3 are the increasing doses of the other component. Um, the standard deviation was 0.9, placebo out of response of 1.6, and there's an example where there are two doses or two combinations that have the target level of response 0.5 highlighted. Those are the 2.1s, and one dose combination has the target level of response uh, that's one different from placebo. So that's a good dose response curve. And then there's the null dose response curve that was simulated. And then we defined these additional scenarios. Excuse me, on the left is a constant response of 2.1 regardless of combination, similarly for 2.6. And then um, the client insisted on looking at what would happen if the um, response was non-decreasing. Um, so so we, we constructed the, the, you know, a reverse dose response curve um, just to see what would happen. Um, he, they didn't believe that that was underlying. They, they believed strongly in the isotonic assumption, but they asked the question, so we did the simulation. Um, and then there was a U-shaped example that, that they said, well, what would it do if you had a U-shaped curve? And, and that's, that's in the lower right there. And then we had some other configurations of, of, um, uh, of, of monotonic curves, and, and those are shown on this slide, and we give them names. There's a linear where the incremental increase is constant. Um, there's a linear, but then plateauing at the top level of response, um, a linear that's, that's a, a lower type of dose response, and, and then an asymmetric one um, that, that's in the lower right. Um, and then there were a couple of more. Uh, one had a little bit higher response um, at up to 2.8, and, and one was uh, uh, only had one active drug. Um, I don't need to do this slide, but you can take the three by three and write them all um, uh, in, in sequence with the levels of um, levels of R remaining constant, and then increasing Ds uh, within each level of R. Um, and, and then these are all the dose response curves <laughs> written that way. Um, so here are the number of subjects assigned. Um, y y y y y to look at this very carefully, you'd want to remember what the dose response curve was and look at the sample size that was assigned. Um, but, but we gave them names, so I wrote the names uh, to identify the true dose response curves. Um, I've highlighted the cells that have target levels of response. Um, so you can see kind of a pattern of increasing numbers of subjects where the, um, where the highlighted cells are. Um, th this is relatively small sample size spread across a wide region. Um, so we weren't thrilled to see that. We're a little disappointed that that it wasn't it, it wasn't working as 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 well as we had hoped uh, in that uh, in that circumstance. Um, these are the cases where there's only one active uh, treatment added in, um, and, and they did a little bit better in those two. Um, and that, but the power was reasonably adequate. Um, the percent identifying at the lower target and at or near the lower target was generally high, um, except for the case where we had a U-shaped curve and except for the all 2.1 response curve. Um, but when it was all 2.1, uh, 
Um, a post hoc analysis would probably combine all nine treatments and compare to placebo and probably work well anyway, but um, in a phase two arena, you know, you, you could do that. So these results convinced us that we're doing okay. Um, and, and then the percent at or near the upper target was generally good, uh, again, except um, for the decreasing uh, curve, which we didn't think was was going to be useful anyway. Um, so given these results, the sponsor chose to adopt this three by three adaptive approach instead of doing a three or four selected combinations. Can I ask the question on the previous slide? Yeah. One this one. And yeah. Well, Uh, yeah, we put a futility analysis in. So we do an isotonic regression and um, test the top dose versus placebo, find no effect or strong evidence of no effect, and then stop early. We did not insert that criteria into these simulations, but um, for, the, for the final protocol, we'll rerun simulations to, to do that. So in summary for this case study, it, it does permit assessment of more doses than a traditional design and it retains reasonable power. Um, it, it tends to assign more subjects towards the target, but not many more, but it did have adequate probability of estimating at or adjacent to the target dose. And so f for that reason, um, it, it was chosen. And, and, and as I mentioned, um, we can insert early stopping for futility, but, but we didn't do it yet. Um, and so then the next steps are um, to look at modifications of the sample size um, and put in the futility stop. So the last um, case study is again, uh, a proof of concept and dose exploration, this time via a linear clinical utility function. Um, the outline is uh, first to talk about the adaptive design and explain the utility function that was used and then simulation results of two design choices. We compared um, the maximizing design, which I talked about in the first case study, to one that uses a normal dynamic linear model um, and um, found that that was better in this circumstance. So the overall summary is very similar to the overall summary for case study one. Um, so I'm not going to go over it because it's essentially the same story except with a different utility function and a different analysis method. Uh, I mean a different uh, uh, patient assignment algorithm method. In this case, um, we had a continuous efficacy response and a continuous tolerability response. So now, rather than um, basing utility on proportions of subjects with AEs, which we could not really get a nice utility value on an individual patient basis, because the safety observation is either a zero or a one. So we did it on a cohort by cohort basis. In this case, we can define a clinical utility value for each subject, and that's based on his efficacy response and his, his um, um, blood pressure response. Um, and instead of placebo, we can use baseline. Um, so the efficacy target difference from placebo for efficacy is four units. Um, I can't tell you what therapeutic area it's in because this protocol is still in development. Uh, well, actually, the study's starting next month, so it's approved. Um, uh, but but it's, the, the efficacy target is four. Um, you'll get a feel for the standard deviation later. Um, 
the blood pressure target is is a is a, the, the the target difference from placebo is to have it less than 10. Um, so, in combining the clinical utility, um, we're going to multiply the efficacy response by 10 and divide by 4 um, in order to scale it similarly to blood pressure. And then we can weight the two of them. Um, and the clinician right away said, I want to weight efficacy 50% more than tolerability. And so doing that yields these example clinical utility values when there's no efficacy in the first case and no, toler no, no difference from uh, the, 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 the 10 unit uh, blood pressure effect, we get a zero. Um, when there's a 10 unit blood pressure effect, um, we get a, a, a minus 10. When there's no blood pressure effect and there's a four unit um, efficacy, we get a plus 15. Um, and when there's both, um, we get a plus five, and that's because we weighted efficacy more than tolerability. Uh, but if the blood pressure effect gets larger than 10, then that'll have a detrimental effect on the clinical utility in the face of efficacy. So the efficacy and tolerability, true underlying curves that we used are on this slide. Um, in this case, uh, we, we, we defined four efficacy curves and four blood pressure response curves. And, and these are blood pressure increases um, with increasing dose, uh, which are bad. Um, and then if you put them together, you get this spectrum of clinical utility functions. Uh, this design had five doses plus placebo. The first cohort was 24, equally allocated to all doses and placebo. And then there were 10 cohorts of 14, seven on each of two doses adaptively assigned per the maximizing design at first. And, and the adaptive design permitted early stopping for futility if the conditional power was less than 10%, uh, but after a minimum of 60 subjects. Th there was a response lag of two weeks in this trial um, that permitted the one week observation period um, for, for one week of treatment and then one week to collect and analyze the data. A and we assumed a 13 per week enrollment over 15 weeks to achieve the total sample size. So the results were simulated with the maximizing design that I talked about before. And the results are on, on this slide. Um, you can see that uh, the, the, the doses with the highest clinical utility are, are highlighted in yellow here, and you can see that um, it, it generally maximizes the, the number of subjects assigned to the, to the dose with maximum utility. And then we compared to the non-adaptive design, um, if we just would have done equal allocation, and we saw generally similar performance for the adaptive design versus the, 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 the traditional design in percent of simulations estimating the target dose and um, percent of simulations uh, identifying at or at or near the target dose. So then why adaptive? Well, why adaptive is because we are increasing the number of subjects at, at the dose with maximum clinical utility, and then that gives us um, better estimates of secondary endpoints and other safety at those doses. Um, then, because the adaptive design was not performing better than the traditional design, we looked at a normal dynamic linear model uh, adaptive approach. And, 
If you're not familiar with that, I don't have time to go over it, but for those of you that do, um, we found generally better performance with the NDLM design than with the maximizing design. And so the final protocol um, is using the NDLM design um, because its performance characteristics were better. Um, here are uh, the number of subjects assigned, and you can see generally greater numbers of subjects assigned with the NDLM design than the maximizing design at, at the target. And on the previous slide, you saw the better performance in estimating the correct uh, dose. So again, the summary is similar to the summary for the first case study. Um, higher probability of estimating the correct or nearly the correct dose with maximum utility, in this case using a linear utility function and maximizing assignment of doses at or adjacent to the dose with maximum utility and minimizing away from it. There are some additional steps to consider for this example. Um, uh, we, we could consider obviously modifying the sample size and then um, perhaps consider refining the utility function. Um, this protocol is not yet finalized, so there's still opportunity to do that. <coughs> and the references for the uh, maximizing design and, and the 2012 um, uh, Bayesian isotonic regression are here. Um, and uh, the NDLM is covered in the Compass user manual, which is available from CITEL. <laughs>